Hey everyone and welcome to Cross Border Interviews. Today's a special day. It's our first episode. I sit down with the former Calgary Cross MLA, the first openly LGBT cabinet minister in Alberta, and most importantly, my husband, Ricardo Miranda. Over the next hour, we talk about politics, his time in government, and pressures of being one of the first three LGBT MLAs elected in Alberta. Also, we do talk about our marriage. So sit back, enjoy, and here is Cross Border Interviews featuring Ricardo Miranda. You've done this before. (laughs) So first off, I want to thank you for being the first guest on Cross Border Interviews. Um, As you know, uh, this has been a pet project of mine for the past, I'd say, two, three months when I first initially brought it to your attention that I was going to do something along this lines. And I think your initial reaction was, I have no idea what you're talking about. Come talk to me when I'm actually awake. I believe that was my response at the time because you came and asked me around 7.30 in the morning when this kind of came to you. And as you know, I'm not the best morning person out there. And whenever you wake me up before 9.30 in the morning, you don't usually get a good response from me. No, and I've learned that so far. So uh, the... And by the way, congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'm very proud of you. I know that you've been thinking about doing something like this for a while. And it's great to see you kind of put things together. And it, it's been really... Um, it's been really cool to watch you in action, so congratulations. And thank you for having me as your first guest. Well, who would I, who would I, if I didn't have you, I know I would have heard about it for about a week, oh. two weeks, three weeks, possibly for the rest of my life. Well, maybe for a couple of months. Maybe for a couple of months, but no, no. I And you know what, it's, it's interesting because I have done podcasts before, but um, this is the first time I get interviewed by my husband, so it's kind of cool. The reason I'm doing this, and I think I've told you about this, and I have told you, but I just want to make sure that the listeners do actually hear about it. Um, As a former journalist, I hate, hate when you talk to someone and you cut their sound bite down to 30 seconds after a 20 minute interview. That was the worst part for me. And I thought, who who best to get to know first than my husband? So, um, as you, as my listeners are probably aware from my introduction, you were the former Minister of Tourism and Sports and Culture. Cult, c- culture and Sports. My God. <laughs> Minister of Culture and Tourism responsible for the Francophone Secretariat. And Sports. Sports was part of culture. Sports was part of, part of culture. So before we get into that, I, I really want to know, and I think this is the first question, I, I'm going to ask everyone this. Where did your sense of service and duty come from? Um, that's an interesting question. I uh, now have to think about this one too. Um, you know, when when I was growing up, we went through a civil war in, uh, in Nicaragua, and that's the reason why we came here as refugees in, in 1988 to Calgary specific, specifically. And I always had this very um, feeling of gratefulness for everything that this country gave me, the opportunities that it gave me. And surely there have been um, barriers and all kinds of people that have stood in my way trying to tell me what I can and cannot do. But those less spectacular people aside, my experience has been one of being cared for and welcomed into this country. And I always felt a sense of, uh, of responsibility and of duty to want to give back. So I, it, it wasn't always the thought of actually being in public office. In fact, um, I, I guess I've always had this sense of also justice in me. And, um, and I, I actually got involved when I was a flight attendant um, and became part of the union as an elected officer. And it was because I saw a lot of people's rights not being protected and I thought, you know, we live in a country where we have all these rights and freedoms and all these guarantees that our collective agreement give us and, um, and I saw some people not being treated fairly while others were getting away with things that they ought not to have been getting away with. So that sense of, sense of um, I guess, a desire for justice and a sense of, um, of uh, citizenship was always with me and it was something that I, I think I learned from my mother as well because she's very much the same way. Um, but my entire family, to be fair, is like that. So 
I think that's that's where it comes from. You mentioned it a bit there. So would you say that your first uh, foyer into uh, public service would be your flight attendant days, or would it go back further than that? Um, before that, actually, I remember during the Klein years when the cuts came down, and you may not remember this because you may not have been born at the time, uh, um, but uh, I was actually in grade 10, I believe it was, or maybe grade 9, can't remember anymore, so, so long ago, um, that the cuts were being made and a whole bunch of students across the city decided to protest and walk out of class. And, um, and I did that, and I remember uh, sending a letter to then Premier Klein expressing my uh, disappointment in the cuts and my desire for all those cuts to be reinstated. And um, ever since then, I always kind of became engaged politically, but not to the point of actually being you know, thinking about being an elected um, personality of, of sorts. Being that young, did you ever think that you'd ever get elected? Uh, be in provincial politics or even federal or municipal? Not, not, no, not at all. Never did I think I would. I, and I never, it never really crossed my mind, right? Um, not because I thought it was impossible, but because I, I, the, the, the background in my family, uh, where we come from, you just don't get involved in politics. You don't get involved in these kinds of things because people disappear, right? People get killed, people get murdered or, or, or tortured. And, and so um, culturally, it's kind of difficult. So I think there's a, uh, I'm not sure if I would say it's a official story or a Wikipedia story, but according to some, I, I, I remember reading about it, but Premier Notley's husband asked you to run? Yeah, you know, what happened was, um, so when I was, I was after I was elected uh, as the president of my union, I, uh, I started working with the national union, QP National, and, um, and Lou happened to be the communications officer for QP Alberta, and I was the researcher for QP Alberta. And so the two of us worked closely on many files. And I remember asking him um, if, if he was ever going to run for office because, you know, he was very passionate and he kept talking about the things that I cared about, um, you know, uh, ensuring that public services were maintained, ensuring that education was kept uh, and improved. And so he just turned around and said, well, when are you going to run? And I kind of I kind of laughed about it at first, but then he became more serious, and he said, "You know, we're recruiting people of all backgrounds. That's what the the party is about." And, and he said, "Rachel is specifically looking for people with diverse experiences and backgrounds, and uh, it, you should really think about doing this." And the more I talked about it. Um, I was kind of bamboozled into thinking that it was a very strenuous process, and it wasn't. <laughs> I thought it was going to be like this um, this process of, uh, you know, you have to go through all kinds of interviews and all kinds of disclosures, and it turned out to not be the case. But he led me to believe that it was, which made me want it even more. But, uh, uh, but at the end, you know, I ended up on the ballot. So did you talk to family members before you did this? Because putting yourself out there in this public way, especially in Alberta for an ND, uh, uh, candidate would be hard to put your family through that. Did, did you have conversations with your mother and your family as well? I did. And, and you know, everybody said to me, you should always follow your dreams. And if you're passionate about this, um, you should do it. They all said to me, you know, you're not going to win. Um, and uh, But at the very least, I said, I will bring to the forefront the issues that are important to me. And I was hoping through that process to be able to bring light to the concerns that people in my community have told me that they felt, right? And as you know, my family all live in here, in, this, in the Northeast, and the issues that affect them as families every day, uh, the things that I'm aware of, the things that affect me as well, because I'm a resident here, um, well, we are now resident here, um, and all those things were in my, in my mind when I decided to run, and when I told them, they were, they were very happy. I mean, all of them went knocking with me and, uh, and were very, very, um, my mother started cooking all kinds of stuff and uh, she would sell it and make, um, make money that way to, uh, for my campaign. But we ended up, I think, I can't remember exactly how much we spent, but it wasn't much. It may have been 6,000 bucks, I think. And you were going up against a pretty prominent uh, 
opposition, or at that time, government MLA, well, a candidate running for MLA, Rick Hansen, the former police chief of Calgary, that must have put a little bit more strenuous uh, 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 atmosphere when you were out knocking on doors because he was so recognizable and you might not have been. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't even that. I, um, first of all, I have a lot of respect for, for um, former Chief Hansen. I think what he did for the city in terms of policing was, was really um, was really progressive in terms of um, the way that they, he approached community policing. And I had, I had nothing um, against him personally, right? I, I, in fact, um, I had not met him personally, but I had come in circles where he was, um, again, QP, representing uh, city workers in the city of Calgary. Um, and he was also um, you know, in those kinds of circles. But uh, all that to say is that um, because nobody ever gave me a hope in hell, it, it never occurred to me whether somebody was high profile, low profile. It didn't make a difference, right? It was the, I ran the same campaign that I would have ran had it been a low profile campaign. So 2015, May rolls around, election day. What was your anticipation at that day? Well, uh, given that I was going to school at the time, that I still had a full-time job, and that I still had all kinds of responsibilities in my life, plus doing the door knocking and, and whatever else I could do within a very limited campaign. I didn't have a lot of expectations, to be honest. And um, we heard from um, the party um, about um, meeting up in downtown Calgary so that uh, we could all be together as a result came in. And I have been part of that because I, I have door knock for previous in previous elections for previous candidates and it was always the um, meeting somewhere in the city somebody bringing a, a borrowed tv and hopefully watching the result and everybody giving everybody kudos for working so hard and then going home right um, but as the night started progressing and we started seeing the early results i, I kept thinking oh wow oh wow this is happening and then my um I, I don't know if it was panic or whatever it was, but um, I, I, I saw that um, the NDP was going to form a government, and I thought, oh my God, what if I don't get to be a part of this? And that kind of scared me because I, I thought, oh my God, this is, this is a, an opportunity of a lifetime to do some positive change, um, to, to do things that matter to people like me, right? And, and then I think it was close to the end of the night, where, um, as proverbial New Democrats, they had only rented the hall until midnight, and, or something close to, close to that. Anyways, we were coming to an end, and, um, and it was Joe Cece who uh, kind of pushed me and said, if you don't do this now, you won't, you won't get a chance to, because you know this is, this is gonna be over soon. And, uh, but I hadn't been elected yet, and I, I, I kept telling him, I'm not, I'm not declared elected. I, I can't go up and do a speech like everybody else I've been doing up until then. Whoever, as in, as were being uh, acclaimed as being elected, they got a chance to say something. And frankly, I didn't have anything prepared. I had a concession speech, and I had, um, you know, a couple of lines memorized in case I was asked uh, questions by the media. But I had no acceptance speech whatsoever. Now I have been a flight attendant for many, many years, and so I spent all those years saying to people. Welcome to Calgary, local time, etc. And so the, I guess, training kicks in at that moment because when somebody shoved the microphone in my face, the first thing I said was, welcome to the new Alberta. And then the next day, very next day, it was the same line that was in the, as a header in the, in the front page of the newspaper. And, and that really brought to mind what um, the, the responsibility and the weight of the office because the things that I that I said from that from then on could be interpreted in a way, uh, could become news, so to speak, and could have a, an effect one way or another. So I became mindful of what I said, how I said it. That moment, it was very clear to me the responsibility that was thrust upon me. Now let's just go back here for a second. Openly gay, Calgarian, running for office never been one in the history of Alberta. 
three are elected that night. Yeah. Was there any weight on your shoulders that that change in attitude towards the LGB, LGBT community had gone so far since the 80s, since you first arrived in Canada, to now where there are three openly LGBT members in office, let alone in government? You know, I um, thinking back, and I guess you can you you, you can. T- <laughs> I'm just dating myself at this point. Um, I remember the first years of the of, of Pride in Calgary, where um, and as I read this, I didn't I, I I remember how bad it was that people didn't want to march. Um, with their faces um, open, like they, they would put bags, paper bags over their faces so they could, because in those days you could be fired, you could lose your job, you could be kicked out of your apartment, like there was no protection whatsoever, right? And so, you know, just a few decades later and here we are, um, I, I, I didn't run to be the first anything. I ran because my community I thought was not being properly served and I, did not intend to be the first of any of those things that you mentioned. I ran um, to make a difference in, and I guess that kind of became uh, a side story of its own. And I kept being asked, I remember um, when I was appointed to cabinet about the first, being the first openly gay uh, cabinet minister, and I, I remember telling one of the journalists that I, was, that I was also openly Hispanic and openly Jewish. And was there any interest to talk about those parts of, of my identity? Uh, they kind of chuckled and kind of walked away. And I always found it very interesting that they picked up that one thing and nothing else, right? Because um, as far as diversity, um, you know, it's it's not that many times that you have somebody with the, these many intersections um, being elected into office, um, let alone being appointed to cabinet. So that was um, that was a first, and um, I don't know. I, I, I it was a, it was a, a, an issue of uh, chance, but also I think very intentional on the part of Rachel because she wanted to have people in her um, in her cabinet that reflected Albertans, right? And she has been a very strong, and the, and the NDP, Alberta uh, NDP, have always been very strong um, allies for the community. So uh, this year, for example, in Calgary, I was very disappointed to hear uh, that they were not allowed to march because they have been able, they, they have always been able to meet the, the, the requirements uh, needed to march at these parades and have uh, policies, have recruiting and, and having a positive environment. Um, the labor movement and the NDP having strong um, ties going back many, many years. The labor movement, um, when I was a flight attendant, if you can imagine, long before it became commonplace in most other workplaces, it was same-sex uh, benefits and it was like nobody even batted an eyelash, right? Um, it was just a very welcoming workplace, very safe workplace um, for the most part. So it was it was daunting, um, but I was so focused on my community and the things that I wanted to see for my community that it, it wasn't something that it was in the forefront when I was thinking about running for office or even when I was elected or appointed to cabinet. And if I'm not mistaken, you said that you were thrice cursed. Yes. And it was probably... <laughs> thrice blessed, I believe. Well. Blessed, sorry. Um, because you were a member of the LGB community, you were Jewish, and you're an immigrant. A refugee. Refugee. Three things that you don't typically think of when you think of Alberta. So when you... Now you might, but the stereotypical Albertan might not... Uh, have that image, right? Because when I came from Ontario, the first thing I thought was everyone's going to be walking around in cowboy hats when I come here. Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that A, I'd be living under a uh, Alberta NDP government in Alberta because you always heard about Ralph Klein at Estelle Mack, Alison Redford, you had heard about the Conservatives. So when coming here, the diversity in the caucus that was elected in 2015 sort of broke down those barriers because there was a wide range of young people elected. Uh, people 
coming back from retirement? Exactly. People coming back from retirement, uh, all walks of life, lawyers, nurses, everything. And then... Alberta got a new culture shock in some sense. So when you said you were thrice, uh, thrice blessed, as you say, um, do you think that Alberta in whole was blessed because you got that diverse government in 2015? Wait, no, just to backtrack a bit. Um, being a flight attendant, I've had the opportunity to live in many places in the world. I, I pretty much have gone to every single continent with the exception of Antarctica. Um, as you know, you and I have already started our, our treks around the world ourselves. If I can get to cold places, I'll go. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is, I've, I've always had the opportunity to live elsewhere, except for Alberta. But, uh, and people have asked me, why are you still in Alberta? You should live in Toronto, you should come to Vancouver, you should come to Montreal, whatever. Um, and the thing is, when I came from Nicaragua and I came to Canada, Calgary was the first place I felt safe. And this was the place that I feel at home, right? When I think of the, the country that I came from, the city where I was born, um, I don't think of those places as home. Uh, of course, there's a familiarity with that. But when I think of home, I think of Calgary, specifically the Northeast, because this is where my family memories are. This is where my childhood, for the most part, took place. Um, the happiest of memories, the memories that I have from Nicaragua are, are not so pleasant, right? They they involve war, um, lots of challenges, and, and lots of very unfortunate things. So, um, so for me, Calgary, uh, Alberta have always represented a really cool place to live, a really safe place to live. Now, I understand that wasn't always the case for everybody, and I know that there were challenges. And to be to be perfectly clear, it's only during the stampede that everybody is required to wear a cowboy hat, but only for a specific period of time. Anytime other than that, it's very, very up to you. Uh, no one is forced to do that, but it's part of the, the it's part and parcel with the history, the heritage of the, of the city, and, and the history of the province. And when people ask me, why are you still there? I would say, well, why are you here? Uh, there's so many really cool things happening in the city, in the province, um, in terms of our energy sector, we're like innovators. We have a really amazing group of people working in the arts. So it's, to, to me, that it, it, it's a really outdated um, stereotype of who Albertans are, to be fair, um, because we've changed, we have transformed, and, and you know, stereotypes are, are what they are, and people make them out to be more than they really are, uh, unfortunately. But Alberta is a, it's a really cool place to live, you know? And I, I don't see myself living anywhere else. That's not true. I, I, could, I could see myself living in a place like Halifax or St. John's because it's, kind of, it's got the same vibe, very welcoming, friendly, echo. We will discuss that a little later today. <laughs> um, so let's, let's get back to your government days. Um, you got the call from whoever you got the call for from about get going into cabinet. Who was your first call? Uh, the first thing I was told is you cannot tell this to anyone because if you tell anyone, we will not we will not call you back. <laughs> so I didn't tell it anyone. In fact, I kept it to myself until I was told I could tell uh, someone the day before I was sworn in. And I'm assuming that was your mother? That was my mother, yes. And what was her initial reaction? Well, uh, she was thrilled. She was um, she was very happy. I can't remember exactly what what, it, what the words were, but um, I mean, I expected that because my mom has always been my biggest uh, fan and uh, the, the one who's always believed in me the most. Um, so yeah, no, it was, it was pretty special, but I... Uh, and when did it hit you that you were being elevated to a position that not many people in this province or even in this country have ever been at? And also, when did it hit you that the weight on your shoulders now, being an elected official just looking after your constituents, now has a larger, more impact because you're making cabinet decisions on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, it didn't hit me until the moment I was sworn in, because up until then, I didn't think it was really happening. Um, I didn't find out what my portfolio was until the day the day before. 
In fact, <laughs> I'm going to get her in trouble for saying this, but my former chief of staff, Lisa, called me and she's like, hello, it's Lisa, I'm your new chief of staff and uh, welcome to Culture and Tourism. And I was like, oh, so it's Culture and Tourism. She's like, you, you didn't know? I'm like, no. It's just like, forget I called you, forget I said this thing. <laughs> so, uh, so then I was like, oh my God, like, there's so many things within culture and, and, and to be honest, um, really at the beginning, after we were elected, Rachel took the time to call everybody and have a conversation. If you can imagine, she's a brand new premier. She's trying to put uh, a cabinet together. She's trying to put a government together. She's doing all these other things. But she took the time to call every single one of us and have a conversation about what we thought um, our roles would be within the caucus and what our ambitions, quote unquote, were. And I remember talking to her and I said, if, uh, if you're looking for somebody to work in culture and tourism, I said, keep me in mind because I would love that portfolio. And I would keep dropping hints throughout. So I think she got she got the hint eventually. Uh, so I was really pleased with culture because I was the only ministry I actually wanted uh, if I was going to cabinet. And uh, did you want to be in cabinet? I wanted to be. I wanted to be somebody who could actually have influence in the decision making process. And I was. I always felt that I was. But um, but in terms of being in the minutia of governance, um, the more I realized that there was a possibility for me to be in, in uh, cabinet, the more I thought that uh, I might be interested in doing it. But I, I never really thought I was going to be uh, picked for cabinet, right? Because who knows what goes into that decision. I, I, I still to this day don't know why she picked me over anybody else. Now, tourism and culture, one of the most uh I wouldn't say low profile, but it's not the ones that like finance energy for Alberta. It's not uh, prominent in the day to day question period. So when you were dealing with your portfolio, you were crisscrossing this province, meeting with stakeholders. Um, how did you bring your uh, portfolio forward at cabinet meetings? Did you talk to, did you look at it more as in, we need to make sure that tourists come here or was there another way that you looked at it to make sure tourism and culture and sports and Francophone affairs wasn't forgotten? Well, um, going back to what I was telling you earlier about uh, changing people's perceptions about the stereotypes that they held about Albertans, that was one of the things I told uh, Rachel I wanted to do. I wanted to do something that was going to change radically how people thought of Alberta and Albertans when they thought about coming here or visiting or for business or whatever. And I said, we, we have a, an image issue because when people think of us, they don't see the natural beauty. They think we're an oil refinery from one end of the province to another, right? That's the image that people have. That's what I had. And, and, it's, and you're not wrong in terms of um, what people outside who've never been here think of when they think of Alberta. And, you know, we, have, we, we needed to change that. I, I think we have, we've had a story told not by us, but by other people, special interests, unfortunately, sometimes. Um, and it has distorted what um, what Alberta and Albertans are really about. And um, and so that was one of the things that I wanted to do, change the outward um, experiences. So when you look at the travel Alberta, for example, um, the, the, the videos that we shot, you will see, for example, two young men holding hands going into a festival, right? Um, giving, giving, people, the imagery that uh, LGBTQ people are welcome here. Uh, one thing, um, I was part of um, second the second province who actually instituted an Indigenous Tourism Association because people want to hear the stories of Indigenous people. They want to know uh, from the people who know the land best what is there uh, to know and what is there to, to understand and appreciate. So, um, so all those things that I worked on was always with the intention, uh, ultimately, of projecting a new image, the, the, the more true image of what Alberta really is today. Um, and I will say because Rachel has a deep appreciation for the arts, my ministry never flew under the radar for her. Uh, she was very, very involved and always asking, asking me questions about different files that she was interested in. Again, her daughter is a dancer. She has always been uh, one to not ever miss a, um, 
a folk uh, festival uh, in either Edmonton or Calgary. Um, and, uh, and she has, uh, she, so she has a background, right? And so she was always interested, and she told me once that if she wasn't premier, it was culture and tourism, the, the portfolio she would want to have. And I told her, back off, sister. You got a job to do. I got my job. You stay on your lane. I stay in mine. So were you able to bounce ideas off of her? Because as premier, she's probably busy. She's got lots of other portfolios that she has to worry about. She, uh, like, you're one por- one part of a uh, engine that is going. And were you able to go to her and say, okay, this is what we're thinking about? Or did she give you the leeway to say, okay, I trust you. Go for it. She gave us all freedom to act within our, our minister's purview. She uh, she always had questions. And as, as much as I prepared before a cabinet meeting to brief her on a specific file of, in my ministry, trying to anticipate the kinds of questions she might have, she would always pinpoint to the one thing that nobody had thought about, that nobody had even considered. And then it was like, ah, you know that moment? You're like, you're waiting for that question because you know it's coming. And she had the ability to kind of take this very, um, she has the ability to take this very complex idea, uh, uh, issue, and break it down into digestible parts. And she did that often. Um, and, and it was good because we, through the dialogue, and, and, and she, it wasn't just her and I, it was at the cabinet table. Um, so not just her, but everybody got to have an input through committees uh, uh, and through everything. But when when there were specific files that were very sensitive, for example, the Olympic bid, um, we did have a chance to sit down and go through those. But as far as administrating my uh, my staff and my ministry, it was left up to me and my chief of staff. And of course, they were always checking in, um, making sure that we had what we needed. Most of the time, it was to figure out where there might be problems um, or why things were not being done, and where what levers to pull to pull within the public service in order for things to get done. Right. Um, None of us have ever been, had any experience in, in, in being in government, so um, we didn't know what the, where the levers were and, and how to pull them. So that was part of the challenge, the growing pains. Um, and, in, and in that respect, we did have the opportunity to check in with her. But it was more at the cabinet table. It, like you said, she was very busy, and, um, and unless it was a very high profile, which there were many, um, then she would leave us to do our job, um, and then, if there was something that she was not um, sure about, she would she would bring it up. But it was mostly again during um, our cabinet meetings and through a discussion. It wasn't like, how dare you do this? How could you do this? Blah blah blah. It was more like, have you guys thought about this? And what do you think this would be for? Blah 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 blah. You know. And uh, and so every time I had to present to cabinet, um, I was always sweating because I knew she was going to ask me a question that I would not have the answer to. And, uh, and it wasn't just me, thankfully, it was every cabinet minister, no matter how well prepared they were, no matter how well they knew their file, she always found something that had everybody scratch their head going, oh, how could I miss that? It was pretty cool, actually. So, looking back on your time in cabinet, uh, did you feel a sense of responsibility to meet with all stakeholders because I, like Alberta is a very diverse uh, community, uh, province as I've learned in the last uh, few years of driving around and seeing all the different locations whether it be Drumheller whether it be the Rocky Mountains whether it be uh, uh, Waterton National Park whether it be up in Peace River whether it be Fort McMurray what was you, like when you first got that portfolio did you make an effort to go to all these places to meet with the stakeholders or how how was that uh, stakeholder engagement process for you done? Um, interesting. When I was appointed, the first thing I received was, it was this very huge binder uh, with briefings in it, telling me um, about all the hot topics, the issues that were still being discussed, the things that were coming up in the horizon. And I was told that we could be setting up meetings for the next couple of days to bring me up to speed and to sit down with officials, etc. And I kind of looked at my chief of staff and I said, I'm not interested in doing that. I'm not interested in sitting behind a desk and doing this because tourism is not something you can read about. 
tourism is the kind of thing that you need to experience. It's, it's an experiential um, kind of work. And um, and the only way you get to do that is to go out there. So my first day in office, I actually went out and met stakeholders. It was at Olds College. Um, and, um, and stakeholders that I, I was very close to uh, up to the end of my term. They, they were very uh, ecstatic that I, I, that I made the, 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 the effort to go out. Um, fresh as I was, freshly minted minister, um, that I was going out and facing uh, the stakeholders that I needed to face to hear about their issues and concerns so that I could figure out how I could help them. And I, I maintained that um, throughout my term. It did come at a price because the more I met with, with my stakeholders, uh, I was away from my constituency, right? And I tried to balance that by making sure that my constituency, constituency days were not um, infringed upon, that I, I would go out and, and you know, talk to folks and, and get to hear about what, what mattered to them in the community. So it was, a, it was a very fine balance, but it was a very hectic schedule as a result. I was always on the go, and I was always trying my best. And I remember uh, at the beginning them telling me, Oh, just you wait. You're gonna one day. You're gonna say no to something, and I said, no, no, I'm not gonna say no. Uh, and and I was just so eager to go to all uh, and meet all these people and learn about what they were thinking about. Um, and so I, I did that. I, I just made an effort <clears throat> not to go out with an agenda, but to go out with a blank slate and say, what is the issue? How do we solve it? What, what is in the way, and, and in that process, learn more about the role itself and the ways that I could, I could actually help, you know, make things happen. Did you talk to David? Because David Egan was the Minister of Culture and Tourism as well as Minister of Education before you came on as Minister of Culture and Tourism. So was there a sit-down that was able to happen between the two of you before you being to sort of that tra smooth transition, or was it, here you go, go ahead first? Uh, no, we didn't have a chance to talk briefly had a conversation about the, the top five things that um, he was working on, but he didn't have the time to dedicate to culture and tourism um, a lot of attention because there were so many things happening in education. And, um, and and so there wasn't, I don't think even if we had had the time to sit down, that he would have been very, um, that he would have been able, able to give me a rundown of all the things that were happening because he just didn't have the time, which is the reason why they didn't split the ministry in the first place. It was a lot of work. And um, this one, I mean, every minister goes out and meets with stakeholders. That is that is the main uh, job, um, to hear from them and, and find out what's going on. But um, with culture and tourism, again, they're very experiential kinds of, um, it's an experiential industry. And you can't just read about it. You have to experience it. Have to go talk to the people in the front lines to hear about what's happening more so than getting a synopsis from uh, a briefing note or something like that. So it was it was uh, challenging. It was very challenging. But to me, I found it to be really exhilarating because here I am. I lived in Canada, in Calgary, uh, for all these many years, and it was the first time I had been to some of these cities that I like literally hours away from me, even though I've flown hours to go to the other side of the world, right? Like, so it was, I'm like, no, oh, sometimes you don't know your own backyard, right? And, and there's so many cool places that I, I, I saw in my travels and um, and everybody kept asking me, what's your favorite place? And I just, I, my answer is still to this day is every inch of this province, because I did not go anywhere where I did not find something that made me feel in awe and wanting to go back over and over again. So the next set of questions I'm gonna ask you are a little bit more personal and I hope you're okay with that. Being single, being elected, it must have put a strain on a potential dating life that you might, may or may not have. Because I know speaking I don't know, to you, tell me. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. You tell me, friend. So I mean, we ended up getting married, did we not? Exactly. But um, did you look at it as a I need to focus all my attention on this part of my life right now compared to whether? people might be focusing on their dating life, you thought, okay, let's focus on my work because people have elected me to do this job, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, so I can't be distracted by, I don't want to say frivolous issues, but by potential dating issues. 
you know, I think Rachel gave us a very good example. No matter how busy she was, she always had one day uh, of the week, one, I would say one afternoon in the week, that she dedicated to her family and everybody knew to leave her alone. Right? And she always kept telling us, there has to be uh, a balance in your lives. Uh, politics are not forever. You get elected, you may not get elected, you may get, get re-elected later on, whatever. But the people who will always have your back, and the people who nurture you, and the people who allow you the freedom to, co to continue in this very uh, demanding job are the people you love and call family. So don't neglect them. And it was something that always stuck with me. Um, so did you have that? I, did you I, have a day or an afternoon when you said, I'm back in the constituents, I need half a day with my family, catch up with them, see how they're doing? I did, I did. And, and my staff knew um, that I needed, uh, and when I didn't get that, I would get cranky. So they knew better. You know? Really? <laughs> oh, they yes, they, they can tell you. Uh, I would get cranky because if, if my constituency day was encroached on, or if my family afternoon was encroached on, I I would feel tired for the rest of the week. I wouldn't have chance the chance to recharge, right? Because it is demanding, and you're constantly on, right? Quote unquote on, and. The only way you can recharge your batteries um, is, is by doing the things that you love most or being with the people you love most. So dating was not a priority, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> shocking me for you. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Um, it wasn't something that I thought about often, uh, but it was something that was always in the back of my mind because at the end of the day, after I had an 18 hour day sometimes, where I would have um, experienced all these really cool things, I wouldn't have anybody to come home to me. And, and when I say home to, it was that, uh, that apartment in Edmonton that I was in during the week when I was uh, in session. And when I came home, I found that the things that I had to share with my family, unless they were in cabinet, I couldn't talk to them about uh, these issues because they were in confidentiality, so it's not like I, I couldn't talk about them, first of all. Second of all, the things that I could talk about, they couldn't really relate to because the, the job is very unique and very different than what anybody would say is, is a regular work day. Um, and so it, it was very alienating in that sense. So the people that I relied on were my fellow um, cabinet ministers and my fellow MLAs. And so I grew, uh, my family grew, I would say, by um, the number of MLAs we had in our caucus because we, we had that same uh, feeling of alienation from the people who were not in either our caucus or in our cabinet, who didn't understand the life would you understand the work that was required? And I will say the sacrifice that you make, right? Because you're, you're gone from your family, and when you have, quote unquote, a day off, you usually go into an event, um, giving a speech somewhere, congratulating somebody, or whatever the case may be, which is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but it does take away from your ability to live a, quote unquote, normal life, right? Um, I would not have traded that for the world, but it is challenging. It was challenging. So it wouldn't be my podcast without me talking about me for at least 20 minutes of my time. Of course. <laughs> of course. So let's jump forward to 2017. Uh, 2017, July 3rd. You're coming up to Slave Lake to do some uh, stakeholder outreach with uh, the Minister of Child Services at that time, Danielle Larrabee, uh, the local MLA as well, uh, my friend, mutual friend between us, your seatmate. Yeah. Um, and she told you, I want you to, I'm going to introduce you to this guy, or how, how did that work? Because I, I've never actually asked her because I'm afraid, because I don't want to know what she told you about me. Honestly. God. You know what? I, I I think you need to have her on your podcast and ask her that question. She's up next. Oh, good. Okay. Well, l make sure that she listens to this one so we can actually coordinate our stories. Um, you know, Danielle is a lovely human. She's a very passionate and compassionate person. And um, 
and like many but like many others in our, uh, our caucus and in our cabinet specifically um, we, we were facing challenges in terms of uh, meeting people because when you're going out and meeting uh, stakeholders it's a, at a professional level right you have to keep a professional distance so it's not like you can actually um, intimate with anybody because you never know um, if they could potentially use the information that you're sharing uh, for their businesses, which creates a conflict of interest, you know, like all these different things that kind of pop up. So we, I would say, uh, I, actually I, should, I can only speak for myself, I kept a very intentional professional distance from everybody that I met. <clears throat> and it was both for the benefit of never getting any blurred lines, and also because I understood the potential conflict of interest and and the nature of, of the um, the dynamic, right, minister uh, stakeholder, and it could be challenging. So I, I so so from that perspective, it wasn't something I I I ever thought about um, engaging in. The what what ended up happening was she said I told her. Um, how much I wanted to come and see her constituency because I had seen a picture of her kayaking. Now, I have only done, I had only done it a few times before that, but the times that I kayaked, I loved. And I saw the pictures of her kayaking the year before that, and I said, oh my God, you know, I need to go out to Slave Lake and kayak. Um, it looks like a really cool place to do that. And she said, I love it. You, need to come out you know there's so many potential uh, tourism attractions there we need more folks to come up to Slave Lake and um, like we are uh, a hidden gem right we are one of those hidden gems in the province and she's right Slave Lake is a hidden gem it is called the jewel of the north for a reason oh, awesome. <laughs> there you go uh, especially and the thing I learned when I was there not specifically to you, uh, which is the real the question that you're trying to get me to answer, but uh, as a good politician, <laughs> I will ramble before I get to that. Exactly. Uh, uh, the, but but Perillo, uh, one of the cool things I learned from uh, what the municipality does for uh, to make the beach accessible is that they actually will provide equipment for people who have um, accessibility issues to be able to enjoy the beach. And I was like, oh my God, that is so cool. Because you don't hear about that um, being done proactively in other jurisdictions. And I thought, wow, how progressive. And of course, sitting down um, on, on the beach, on that sand, looking out into the lake, I, I could see myself going out swimming and doing all kinds of things. Like it was it was just a beautiful, beautiful sight. Because she took me up to, um, to a hot, to like Martin Mountain, there which is go. the wildfire lookout as well. There you go. And, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh my God, this is breathtaking. Um, so there were so many cool things in a very small area that um, that I had driven past before, but I never stopped before. And, uh, and and so I was really excited about that. And, uh, and she told me about you. Um, Finally about me. <laughs> <laughs> but enough about you. What do you think? About, yeah. What do you think about me? Um, the uh, what, it, what she said was, there's somebody who is really keen on meeting you. He's a really nice guy, and oh by the way, he's single. And I kind of raised my eyebrow and I said, really? Okay. And then that first day, you did everything but talk to me. Right, because she said she really wants to talk to you. He wants to meet you, because you had posted prior to that, almost a year before, a picture where you came to my office and you take a, took a picture from the door in my office and you posted it and you tagged me on Instagram, I think it was. And I was like, hey, next time say hello, not even knowing who you were. Right, I was just thinking you were another uh, person who was taking a tour of the legislature and you had come upon the ministry, uh, the, the office of the minister, the minister's office at the ledge. And um, you tagged me and I said, you know, like, we have an open door policy, come on in. I may not be able to see you, but you know, whatever. Um, so she said to me, like, he's a really nice guy. And by the way, he's single. And I looked at her, I'm like, what does that have to do with it? Oh, he's gay. And I was like, ah, I kind of laughed about it. Um, 
and uh, and then she she insinuated that you wanted to meet me. But that very first day, you did everything but talk to me. I even went out of my way to say hello to you and shook your hand, and I think I saw you run away faster than I've ever seen anybody run. It was kind of funny. And I kind of laughed about it because afterwards she asked me, so did you talk to him? Did he say anything? And I'm like, uh, no, when I went to shook his hand, he turned around and ran away. And she's like, oh, this is ridiculous. So she did something. She took it upon herself. To I think there was about a 20 minute yell f- yelling a text message that I got of why were you so scared to talk to him? Uh, and then uh, she said to, she sent me a text. She's like, this is his number. Uh, I give up or something along those lines. You call him. You get that schmuck to call talk to you. And I'm like, I'm not calling him. Uh, and anyway, the rest is history. The rest is history. Um, so. Dot, 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 the rest exactly. <laughs> so we get married. We ask the. Are you really jumping? Ahead? Oh, we're jumping ahead. We're jumping ahead. The courtship is all well known. Okay, yeah. you can just follow it on whatever you want. We kept it quiet. And certainly, if you want to talk about the courtship, but we kept our courtship quiet because, from my perspective, I didn't want to. Uh, be a, not an issue, but be a. Oh, you are an issue. <laughs> oh wow! Thanks, husband. Um, I didn't want. I didn't want to be a distraction to uh, your uh, your political career. So we kept it quiet, and then the weekend of the NDP convention in Edmonton, I popped the question. Uh, and we kept it quiet. Now, we... I don't think that's... Well, okay. actually, that's untrue. That's very untrue. Because I said to you, you can tell one person, and by the end of the night, all of Cabinet knew. I'm 90% sure all of your caucus colleagues knew. And by the time we got to the bar for the uh, karaoke, for the NDP karaoke, 90% sure everyone in that oh, that room knew as well. But, I, was, I was getting <laughs> married, dude. I was like, woohoo. Anyway, go on. So... We we decided to uh, not make an announcement when we first got engaged because we wanted to be a private event. Yeah. And then we had a discussion. I want you to talk about it because you explain it a little bit better than I do. But why we decided to come out on December 6th, come out, quote unquote, come out of the marriage closet on December 6th to everyone to say, hey, this is this is happening. You know, um, going back to what you had asked me earlier, in terms of did I feel a responsibility as being the first openly out LGBTQ member of the legislature and minister in the province's history? And I did. Um, and it was something that, that, that was always there. But I did not want to be labeled as quote unquote the gay minister, right? Because again, um, there were so many other things about me that I think are equally as important, if you can call it that. And I'm a very private person, right? And I think you are as well, very private person. But we started, I, I remember seeing a couple of tweets and a couple of things that were happening with respect to the GSAs and the discussion that were taking place. Now, the first call that I received after I got the keys to my MLA office was from a constituent um, of mine who was uh, who was trans and they wanted to tell me how happy they were that they actually had somebody who could understand what they were going through. And although they were not 18 years old and they did not vote for me, that they felt very um, safe, that they had a voice who could speak for them. And and that was one of the, I have to say, the scariest conversations over the phone I ever had in my life. The, the thing about us was that we could have easily done the whole marriage, under the radar, nobody would have been the wiser. Um, MLA Sweet, for example, got married. She kept it under the radar. They did not make the news. It did, nobody ever knew about it because, she, again, she's also a very private person. But the thing is, I remember being in the closet and being that scared young man, afraid of being outed and afraid 
afraid what would happen to me if I was outed. Lucky for me, I had, I didn't know it at the time, but I, uh, and it was unfortunate because it would have made my life easier. But my mother was like, eh, what are you gonna do, right? She, it, like nothing, like, she's the perfect Jewish mama. I am perfect in her eyes, you know? So, you know, there's nothing I could possibly do wrong in her eyes, like I'm just perfect. Of course I'm not, and I know that, but, you know. Um, the thing is, I thought that we owed it to our community to show folks who were, had, who were um, spewing all this vitriol online that it was possible to be a loving, committed, monogamous relationship, willing to take that, that next step into married, married life and doing so in a way that did not bring about the end of civilization as we know it. That didn't change the fundamental fabric of our, of our culture and of our province. That didn't, you know, somehow undo whatever it was they thought we were, we were undoing. And it was okay. And I think the one person who was talking about suicide really brought to me uh, the importance of having us be open. And I think, if I remember correctly, I talked to you about it. And you were hesitant at first because, again, you were saying to me, like, you know, we're going to put a target on our backs, people are going to take shots, are you ready for that? Well, and I think that's most, most of that came from, from my perspective is, uh, as a, were, because after, after we, we were, uh, um, we came out, you got attacked. Yes. In, in Sleep Lake, I remember that. Yes, and I was, I was walking around, actually from Danielle's uh, office, I, I wasn't walking from her office, but near her office, someone pulled down, rolled down the window and yelled, you're a fucking fag, you're going to hell. Ah, you're going to have to bleep that. No, nope. it's an, it, this is it. So when I, because from a rural perspective, I came from a rural area in Ontario, lived in Lloydminster, lived in Slave Lake, lived in Foz. You hear things and there are very uh, religious people and nothing against them. I'm a religious person. Exactly. But they, there was an attitude change when people found out that I was gay in all these communities. It was, oh, you're gay, we're not going to talk to you anymore. So originally when we had this conversation about being open about the marriage, I was very hesitant because I've seen in the past and I know from my experiences that it doesn't go over well that well sometimes. And it's so different in the big cities, it's just that we have a bigger insulation. <laughs> exactly. And I think when I saw that we came out and I would say ninety five percent of the responses that we got were positive, we did get a few that were not. But seven we, pages worth. Exactly. <laughs> we just had to ignore it. I, I tried to ignore it, but I, I found it let me put it this way. If I, if you recall what I said to you was, just think of this. If we do this, we're gonna keep those haters so occupied that they're gonna be turning their hatred towards us and they're gonna leave the kid down the street alone. Yeah. And they're gonna get a break. And I, I had hoped somebody would have given me a break from that. And, and that was a responsibility that you and I owe to our community. I thought, and it was also something that um, that we needed to do for the people who are still living in fear, because there are those who are still living in fear. We know who they are. Some of them much more closeted than others. Some of them, um, unfortunately, being the most homophobic and taking the most homophobic um, positions um, in terms of public policy and having the ability um, to, to set policy in motion. Knowing full well that everybody else knows and still respects because people have asked me, why would you say it? And I said, because I respect the right to people to come out on their own time. I will never, ever set uh, or, or do this horrible thing that I fear all my life, which is to be, to be um, outed before I was ready, before I had what it took to understand um, the implications and ramifications and the consequences of doing that. And to me, it was, and I don't know about, we 
talked about this. It was it was a very real fear of being outed, and it's not something that I wish on even my worst enemy. And that's the reason why I will never participate in something like that, outing somebody who's not ready to come out. But at the same time, since we were out, I I felt more. I think more and more when I read some of the hateful things that were coming in, that we owed it to our community to be out and, and to be open about our relationship and to be open about the fact that we were going to get married and to be open about the fact that our families were uh, happy about it and it was going to be a quote unquote a marriage, not a gay marriage, just a marriage, uh, a meeting of families and all the other things that happen when people get married. And, and let those folks know, even in the rural areas who are still in living in fear, that it is okay and that they too could have something like this, right? Um, and I think we did it for our younger selves too, because I know, I know you told me how you felt and you never thought that you would actually ever find somebody and get married and have a life. Uh, like the life we're living right now. Two dogs, a house, you just finished uh, mowing the, the, the lawn, and after I <laughs> complained about you, the fact that you didn't break the lawn after you mowed the lawn, you break the I picked it up, okay? Oh, cool. um, well, and, and so all those things, to me, I think were important, and I think we, we realized and we came to that conclusion very easily, even though both of us were against the idea in the first place. And looking back on it, I, I understand the way we went about it was the right way, right? Because we had to show people that this is this is the norm and the new normal, right? It's love is love and marriage between a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, a man and a man, or whatever. Not whatever. It's just two humans. Two humans is two uh, of age humans is is normal and is accepted and should be accepted and. The moments after our marriage on December 28th, uh, I, there was a bit of a groundswell of support from the local community that up in Slave Lake and Foss because they didn't know that their words could hurt that, like someone like me when they were using the F word or using the G word. And then they realized that, oh, there are people out there that you may not know are gay who are struggling with it. And they will be more uh, respectful of the word choices. So even the seven-year-old person down the street from me in Faust said that. And I went, wow, like just by coming out, we didn't just change the attitude of the 13-year-old who might be coming uh, to their identity, uh, whether it be LGBT, um, but the 70 year old who's looking back and saying, oh, there are people in, even in our community that have heard me use these words before and I didn't, I don't want to be part of that culture where we're degrading them even though that I'm not sure if I'm degrading them because I don't know the route. So there was a change in attitude that I saw, even in the small perspective that I had, that was a little bit choking for me because I was like, holy crap, it's actually our little marriage, that we, a little wedding that we had has made a positive impact on one or two people. And that's how you change the world. And you know, um, You've heard me say this before. Uh, in Judaism, there is a thing, uh, a saying that goes, "If you if you save a life, you, you save the world, right? Or you save the universe." Um, and I'm not saying that we did any of that. What I'm saying is, we allow somebody to give themselves the opportunity to think that they could also do something like that, and um, actually watch it take place, right? And unfold um, like that in public and. It did not bring about the end of, of Western civilization as we know it. it. It didn't, you know, result in some mass chaos and some horrible um, things like I don't know what it is. Quite honestly, that they expect um, a, a, a two men or two women getting married would actually um, produce. But there are people out there who, who really think that it, it is like I don't know this end of t- end of days, whatever. Um, being a religious person, I don't re- I don't understand that because I can't really relate to their interpretation of of of, uh, of their faith. But whatever. Um, 
all I know was I loved you and I wanted to marry you. And it didn't matter whether we did it in front of um, hundreds of people. <laughs> Which, <laughs> let's be honest, I wanted like 12. <laughs> Don't you start with me. From the beginning, I told you, at the very least, it'll be 54 plus my family, because I was inviting all my colleagues from the, from, from, uh, the caucus. And you said, what about uh, uh, limiting it to 12? And I told you, listen to the words that I'm telling you. 54, at the very least, plus. Um, but whether it was a small wedding or a large wedding, yeah. we ultimately didn't care, because all we really wanted to do at the end of the day was to say our vows. Well, how nervous I was that day to say my vows. We wanted to say our vows and proclaim in front of the people that we care about that we love each other. Yeah, and to be clear, my mother, when you went in for the, uh, you've been out, kiss each other, seal the, your marriage with a kiss, and you went in for like a five minute kiss, I think my mother may have been a little uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not sure, sure my great, my grandmother was uncomfortable, <laughs> and my parents, and everyone in that room. Everybody was uncomfortable, <laughs> including me. I was like, alrighty then, here we go. Anyway. It was uh, the first time we kissed each other as husband and husband, okay. Uh, in front of all those people, yeah. Um, what was it well, say? let's be honest. You did try to go in for a kiss before that, though. That's because I was getting ahead of the... the, the you were getting ahead of the officiant, the premier of Alberta. Who told me, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Wait until I tell you it's okay. Anyway. So, um, my last question, though, uh, is this. Looking back on your time in office... Being who you were, uh, openly gay man, still the same person. Are you? I am. I always look. If you remember, I told you this from the beginning. I I am none of those. I am none of those titles. I am none of those positions. I am none of those. Any of that. I am Ricardo. And because you tried calling me Minister at the beginning, and I told you to call me Ricardo. Uh, because those things were the things that I did, but not who I am, right? I I work, I, I, I performed the role of minister, but that's not who I am. It was never Ricardo um, became an MLA. It was always Ricardo working as an MLA. And I was very clear about that from the beginning. I've always been clear about the fact that if you let go of your, of your sense of self, you get lost. And I never want to be lost because it took me a long time to find myself. And I'm quite happy with who I found. According to you, there are some perks to be worked out. Whatever. <laughs> we'll work on that. Yep. <laughs> and by the way, do not think that this podcast substitutes for uh, mer- medical uh, therapy. Uh, uh, yes, it therapy. does. <laughs> this uh, is my therapy uh, session by, brought to you by Chris Brown. <laughs> because we need to talk about the fact that I went and got you Armani and you asked me, what is Armani? And the thing is still sitting up there. A, 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 a cologne, Armani cologne. Oh, is it cologne? Oh, you basically. I thought it was for shoes. I put it in my feet. I, honest to God, you know what? I don't even want, you need to end this right now because we need to have a serious conversation. Okay, but honestly, thank you very much for doing this. Thank you. Love you. Love you.